Good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me back. Uh, this morning I uh, had splendid talks already and I certainly enjoyed and learned uh, a bit. Um, as I am addressing the high-risk disease issue and its treatment, I like to just show you uh, this uh, graph from a couple of years ago published in Blood and addressing the curability of myeloma. One way to uh, achieve this, and this was done through the successive implementation of new agents into the backbone of total therapy with two auto autologous transplants. And you can see that there are really very long uh, plateaus that emerge at around 10 to 12 years. So in order to really address this issue of curability, it's very important that one follow patients uh, over a very long stretch of time. I had the pleasure to see a patient recently whom I first saw at MD Anderson Hospital in about 1986. And the patient never achieved complete remission, let alone MRD negativity. And uh, he is being treated on and off and uh, it's uh, possible to get overall survival plateaus even in the absence of progression-free survival. We were fortunate when John Shaughnessy joined us at the University of Arkansas, sort of halfway into Total Therapy two, which was a randomized trial uh, addressing the value of added thalidomide. And <clears throat> as you can see here, the 85% of patients uh, who had low risk disease defined by gene expression profiling of purified plasma cells using the 70 gene model identified patients in whom the successive introduction of novel agents really did make a difference. As you can see, uh, with the transition from total therapy to without thalidomide to the addition of thalidomide, and then the subsequent addition of bortezomib in total therapy three, improved outcomes as shown on your left, but the patients the 15% of patients with high-risk disease as defined by this essay really did not benefit. And look at the steepness of the slope uh, for progression-free survival vis-a-vis -vis patients who had low-risk disease. And we, when we uh, addressed the issue of MRD negativity, thinking that perhaps the high-risk disease has a lower frequency of MRD negativity. This could not be confirmed, and at a level of 10 to the minus 5, um, we actually saw similar frequencies of MRD negativity with low and high-risk myeloma. In a multivariate analysis that uh, looked at total therapy three, we looked at the three endpoints, overall event-free survival and CR duration, and the high-risk gene array feature dominated the model. And as you can see for CR duration, an R square value of 40% was reached by entering this very variable, meaning that 40% of all clinical variability could be accounted for by this test. We then ventured out and said not having had any progress in high-risk disease, so we 
remembered that investigators in high-risk large cell lymphoma had gone to investigate successfully the issue of less dose intensity allowing for greater dose density. And so that the treatment-free intervals would be reduced. And sadly, as shown in this slide, as you can see on the bottom left, the CR duration was even worse than it was with the preceding trials. And on your upper left, we see somewhat of an extension of survival, not significant, and that probably was due to the availability of further novel agents. So this was clearly not the way to go. And coming, being eccentric, or learning from my mentor, Dr. Freireich, you must be radical if you just make minor changes in a complex biological system, you will never actually see it. So um, recognizing that there are recurrent mutations as listed here, we um, employed on the second patient in whom we had sent the marrow off for exomic sequencing by Foundation Medicine. And this is a young man who died 12 years after initially being diagnosed. He developed uh, extramedullary disease in the liver, which is a frequent uh, fatal common endpoint in myeloma treated properly. So as I had worked at Dr. Freireich's request in uh, GI oncology, so I knew how to do a hepatic artery infusion therapy. And he had this done three times, the fourth time at Mount Sinai. And they said, oh my God, myeloma in the liver. I said, yes. So he got embolized and then eventually um, he received trametinib, two milligrams a day. And as you can see, within a month, this disease was gone. He developed some uh, cardiac dysfunction, so the treatment was held, and then he had a recurrence, and he did not respond again to this approach. Uh, these are the data with trametinib uh, that I think my colleague, Dr. Hoik, reported. Uh, this was not just trametinib alone, but sometimes in combination with other drugs. But there's clearly a signal of activity for this drug used for melanoma, uh, often confused among myeloma patients with the skin condition. And now we find a drug that works in melanoma regularly and sometimes in myeloma. This is a summary of the monoclonal antibody data with daratumumab that you are all familiar with. Uh, when one adds to daratumumab any one of the immunomodulatory agents, the response rate goes up enormously. And I saw a patient from uh, Texas who had been treated initially with uh, VCD and uh, then on um, follow-up, he had developed extramedullary disease in lymph nodes, muscles, skin, and uh, was on hemodialysis at age 83, physicist by training. So we gave him uh, salvage therapy with VTDAs, collected some stem cells, and then gave him 70 per meter of melphalan, to which he responded, but to relapse within six weeks. 
so there was virtually not a response. I think for anything to be called a response, there ought to be a finite duration which has not been discussed and uh, by the um, International uh, Maloma Working Group. So he had this massive relapse um, and I gave him daratumumab, the first time I ever used this drug. I was a bit annoyed that it would take 10 hours to infuse, and I was a bit afraid in the presence of uh, renal failure on hemodialysis to give full dose, I think, so he got uh, eight milligram per kg the first time around, and within less than one month, the patient achieved complete remission. Um, I must say, I, in my life with myeloma of some 35 years, uh, I have never seen such a wonderful outcome at very limited toxicity, and the patient is now about eight or nine months out, continuing in complete remission. He did not have any uh, skeletal is bone marrow disease, but solely extra medullary disease. So if you wanted to do some MRD testing here, you wouldn't go very far. So then we, um, I had uh, many colleagues in my past who were immunotherapy oriented, including uh, Jordan Gutterman at MD Anderson and Fritz Van Rie uh, in Little Rock. So I had learned a little bit about immune checkpoint inhibitors that do not work when given alone. There are a number of trials in progress with both anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-L1 uh, antibodies as listed here. And oh, this advanced on one screen and not the other. Um, so pembroliz pembrolizumab uh, is one. Can we go back, please? They are somehow out of sync. Um, this was. Uh, reported by my former colleague Ashraf Badros with a high uh, objective response rate, including some complete remissions. And we uh, evaluated nivolumab in patients with myeloma, and uh, this patient had previously been treated with trametinib and had achieved some response, and then we added nivolumab and pomalidomide, which he had seen before, and you can see here a rapid resolution of um, metabolic activity when measured by PET-CT scanning. Um, I remember a talk that the late Judah Frogman gave in this very ballroom on occasion of a leukemia 2000-something uh, meeting. And he talked about the importance of angiogenesis in leukemia, obviously also in myeloma. And when I got into thalidomide, my understanding from Dr. Folkman was the, this was actually the first or second patient who got thalidomide. Um, the wife of the patient had learned about uh, endostatin and angiostatin that had, uh, were still in the preclinical setting. So thalidomide was Dr. Uh, Folkman's advice, which I did. But when we published the paper in the New England Journal, we could not demonstrate any reduction in vascularity and the reviewer kept on bugging me about it, and it was, of course, Charlie Schiffer, who else? And the way he wrote the critique, I identified him, and he didn't even blush. Anyhow, so 
An anti-angiogenic approach can also be practiced with low doses, continuous exposure to certain chemotherapy agents. And uh, this is what we did. We had reported on um, uh, continuous infusions of adriamycin and cisplatin, both at 1.0 milligram per meter squared plus VTD in re relapsed refractory disease. And so we wanted to test this upfront in patients with de novo high-risk myeloma. Uh, this was done uh, initially in Arkansas, and we have another dozen patients or so at Mount Sinai. Now, importantly, on your right uh, lower corner, you see that the uh, gene expression index actually goes down. Previously, we only had seen a worsening from low risk to high risk, but here you can see the reverse can uh, be seen. And uh, my pathology colleagues evaluated the marrow and there was a significant reduction in vascularity after one month of therapy. So patients got only one cycle and shown here is the example of the very first patient whom I then maintained on nivolumab single agent and he's a year out and in stringently defined complete remission with MRD negativity. I believe as I have seen patients with minimal residual disease who still in whom we repeated gene expression profiling and they still have high-risk features. So one gentleman from Philadelphia continues on daratumumab and nivolumab and an imid. And I believe that immunotherapy does not obey the same resistance mechanisms that pertain to genotoxic drugs. And uh, we all have seen anecdotes and obviously uh, controlled clinical trials are important to uh, establish the role of these various agents in combination. It's clear that the mutation burden increases with disease progression, that there is a higher mutation burden present in high-risk disease, and I learned that higher mutation burden implies greater immunogenicity and in attending a seminar on bladder cancer at Mount Sinai with some translational work, I learned that MIC actually um, controls PD-1 and PDL one expression and that some agents like cisplatin and vincristin can induce MIC expression. And so we have a little bit of a rationale for giving our metronomic therapy for one cycle, followed then by um, uh, checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And I'm listing here some highly successful studies, including the one that was published in the New England Journal a week ago on daratumumab, linomide, and dexamethasone by um, Dr. Dimopoulos, and you know, this kind of an approach uh, probably will alter the outcome of patients presenting de novo with high-risk myeloma. Thank you for your attention.